Thank you so much, kind sirs, for making this uh, incredibly fun to watch, but um, crazy chapter in our, you know, uh, fighting for nature history. Um, can you please tell us to start, how did you get involved in this project and why now? I'd say, um, well, I mean, first off, guys, thank you. Thank you for watching. This is the first public screening of <laughs> Yeah, it's great to share this with you. Um, the story started really when we were, my parents are here somewhere, but um, on vacation in New Zealand, the week of the bombing. And it was, so, so we were there as, uh, I don't know, eight, and we happened to be a French-American family on vacation. In, New making Zealand. this film for 40 years? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, so remember, and then we went, we were there in July, and then I remember being in Paris as a kid, being, what's this story of the two owners, these things, you know, they're not quite understanding it. And then years later, it's sort of, it's like, what, what was that story? And, you know, I, I grew up in France, spent a lot of time in the U.S., sort of been, you know, multinational, and, and, and sort of straddling the two worlds was a new, sort of interesting thing. And then, you know, obviously, the, the, the whales were my favorite animal as a kid. Thanks, I mean, they, you, you guys don't know this. Try, try to fit it in the film, but the film has enough in it already. But uh, Rex was, Rex was, um, you know, one of the original campaigners, you know, for saving the whales. I have amazing footage somewhere of him, you know, I mean, to, to basically putting himself between a harpoon and a whale, um, and, you know, I mean, with, with the rest of the guys, and, and I think, uh, uh, really, the, the birth of the environmental mo movement has, we you know it, has, you know, uh, this, this guy played a huge part in it. So I cut a trailer, sent it to Lawrence, and then, and then, I think he called me back seven minutes later and said, do not send this trailer to anybody else. I'm doing a movie. Um, uh, Oh, we're doing it together, so I mean, it was, it was, it was an easy, quick fit. Yeah, if I could, it, it was the most um, exciting trailer I've seen in all my career, and the singular vision of this film sits with Edward's take on it and how to tell a story that is incredibly serious but needs to be told with a, a levity that people can go, okay, they, they get a, there's a moment to relax while you're watching something extraordinarily serious, and. Um, it was beautiful. The minute I saw the trailer, I went, we have to make this film. And um, and then when Rex got involved, it became something special. Um, and I think, Rex, you should tell us a little bit more about what it was like at that time. Can you tell us a little bit about who were you? Like, what happened? We were nobodies. We were, we were young people on the streets, really. Vancouver, uh, Canada, in the 1970s. Um, there was, at that time, like I said in the film, it's just hard to imagine, but there was no environmental movement really at that time. There, there was a strong civil rights movement at that time. There was a strong women's movement at that time. There, uh, there were uh, civil rights movements. Uh, there were indigenous rights movement. And some of us were involved in that. We all were involved in those things. And, and uh, we were involved in the peace movement. And Actually, uh, the Vancouver, one of the early Vancouver women's organizations was one of the big early supporters of us. And, um, but we believed that, had, had learned, you know, as young, really, we were all in our 20s, most of us. Um, but we're, we're destroying the earth. I mean, we, because we knew about the nuclear, uh, the harm of the nuclear testing. There had been things like oil spills in California and, you know, we, we could just see, we were growing up, we were young people growing up and seeing the world being destroyed by technology, by in industry, by chemical companies. They, they used to dump, you can hardly believe it today, but the pipes used to run out in the Fraser River near Vancouver from the from the chemical factories, <laughs> had these pipes that just ran down the river and just were dumping their poisonous, toxic garbage in the river. 
we used to go out. We had a, we we got a boat. And we went up the river and we we made these big corks. <laughs> we brought the we brought the media people with us and we used to cork the uh, <laughs> the the pipes coming out from the chemical plants. So, but what we wanted to do, we just felt like there's these social movements, and yes, we have to look after human rights and take care of ourselves and take care of each other. But we have to take care of the earth, and if we don't do that, the, 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 the civil rights movements that we're all involved with aren't going to matter. That we have to take care of the earth. So there needs to be an ecology movement, and that's why we started doing these things. And then the thing is, we went after the French because we, because of that threat, or that that we, the uh, journalist in Canada says, "Well, you guys are just anti-American. You'd never go after the French." So we thought, "Well, okay, well." <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Let's go after the French. But no, we didn't have any money. Uh, we did everything. Just we used to sell little pens for twenty-five cents. You can imagine. <laughs> and um, so, you know, the, the, I guess this is part of the message, really, uh, of this film, and and really of what we were doing is. You know, now Greenpeace is a huge organization, millions of dollars, and there's thousands of, of ecology groups, environmental groups. But anybody, any one of us, at any time, you got a good idea, and you have the courage to do it, and you, you know, it's not about the money, it's not about anything other than that. Good idea and the courage to do it. Something that, that Greenpeace did really well from the very beginning, yes, exactly is to always have a photographer in all the actions and like really good filmmakers have collaborated with Greenpeace you know throughout the history um, and I, I wonder like I wonder like do you think that today with um, as many more instruments to our disposal as we have that we're doing more or less well that's a really good question but you know, what it really comes down to is storytelling. It doesn't matter how many, you know, what, what reach you have. You know, if you can't come up with an original idea and tell a story, uh, it, it doesn't work. You know, holding, just holding up a sign and saying, stop this or stop that, that wasn't what we were doing. And um, we came, you know, there was a, there was kind of a street theater movement. And, you know, in those days, I'd say in the late 60s, early 70s, there was kind of a merging of the arts and politics, which, which I find doesn't so much exist today. And, you know, artists were out in the streets doing creative street theater around political ideas. <laughs> and the political people were going to the theater people and, um, the film people and, and the media people saying, you know, you guys got to get involved. We gotta, you know, so there was this merging of the arts and 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 uh, politics, and that's kind of what we need to get back. Because you, you've got to have storytellers. Thank goodness. I mean, this was a this was this is a beautifully well told story, right? <laughs> and um, so you know, it's not just saying this is good and this is bad. You got to be able to tell a story. And, Thank you, Edward. <laughs> Edward, did you think you mind bomb us with this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm learning learning from the best, right? Yeah. I mean, the, look, look, this is this is there's a big there's there's a lot of people were not around. I mean, I was a kid in the '80s. A lot of people weren't around to see to see this, and and I think what we have, you know, sort of the the intent behind the film was to say, <laughs> look, you know, this is a lesson for not really even a lesson. It's an entertaining way to, for, for kids these days who want to get involved, you know, sort of remind them that, yeah, you can sort of like, so like Susie says at the end, sleeping on a bunch of t-shirts in an abandoned building, dumpster diving, or all, of, all things she did, you know, and you, you guys did it. So you really actually can make a difference. So, with, you know, and it, and it doesn't have to be talking to the UN to make a difference. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, uh, um, it, it, it doesn't have to be this huge organizational protest. You can do it with six friends in a creative way and actually, you know, actually make a difference on your local level. You know, this is it's the, the early Greenpeace playbook, really is. is and, and you see sort of the havoc you can wreak 
<laughs> it's sort of starting from a couple guys, you know, a couple kids in Vancouver going all the way to from one thing to another in the way that life is absurd, all the way to this big governmental, you know, massive, m massive mess, right? I mean, it's... it's well, it's, it's a state terrorism, that's what it yeah. is. Um, you know, provoke... It's, 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 it, it, you know, I mean, if there weren't people who were there to really put themselves in, in the, it, you know, in the bombing zone, I mean, they're, they're <laughs> going in there and, you know, risking their lives doing it, but in, in, a, in a way that really, you know, provoked overreaction. In a way, so. I think something that is pretty great about the film is that it's so fun to watch. And you know the music, the archival footage that you found, like the way that you mix the images, the editing. So, but at the same time, it's about a very deep and meaningful issue because like journalists and activists are being, you know, killed across the world all the time for all kinds of things, and this is just one of those cases. Um, did you uh, like? D what do you think you want to do with the film? Do you want to think uh, l in a larger scale about? Protecting those activists, like uh, in terms of like um, campaign, uh, outreach campaign, impact, getting more people to do things for the planet. What What's the plan for the movie? How, in which way do you want us to engage moving forward? I mean, I'd love to get this movie, you know, out there to as many people as possible, so that you know maybe we can inspire, you know, inspire a new generation, and and you know, I mean, and it doesn't. It, you see a lot of these a lot of these movies are actually very drab and boring and preachy and say you know well, you know this is this is the way to approach this and this is I mean we were talking about it earlier there's so many so many movies are very very preachy and this is saying like you know life is absurd make a difference you know like don't don't think of yourself as too small um, you know go out there and do something message. Do you guys have any questions? Yes, sir. French uh, <coughs> Secret Service guy you interviewed, did he express any remorse for the death of, uh, was it Fernando, the fellow who Fernando. died? I, I think, I mean, he did. He's been interviewed before, and he had, I mean, it's definitely, it definitely weighs on him. On the other hand, you know, you also have, this is a professional soldier, this is it's not, he's killed other people, um, you know, and, and he'd operated on sort of many different fronts. I think this one was especially complex for him because he had been, he was the guy who bombed Gaddafi's yacht in almost the same operation in Italy um, that he told me about. And no one died in that one, but he'd done many sabotage missions. There's one thing when you're doing it within a military context, and I think this one weighed very heavily on him in that, you know, try to reconcile doing this against environmentalists, you know, I mean, and he, he's, he sort of, you know, he had gone into it saying, okay, it's destruction of material, you know, we're just blowing up a boat, fine. Um, and, but I mean, he is, yeah, it's, it's, it's heavy. He's a soldier, you know, though, and he has to, it's, it's I think for any soldier that's hard to weigh. Um, um, but he's certainly, I think I think in other footage he had apologized to Fernando's family. Um, I don't think they ever met, um, but he is. I mean, he's 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 carrying that. I showed it in in the film. I mean, you see it in this. I think the moment that was the most evocative um, was the look in his eye when he says, "We just you know, we just thought it was going to be a material thing," and that that was the strongest point where I felt like you see. This, you know, the this, this sort of, you know, direct expression of that. So, I don't know if that answers it. Question in the back. Yeah, you mentioned the like the Greenpeace storytelling. Uh, obviously, it makes sense for um, there to be photographers filming the Greenpeace boat. But who is taking the films of the French um, and them in, in their boat in the bay and everything they were doing in New Zealand? And then, how did you get a hold of that footage? Okay, all, all of that, I didn't, I didn't, sh <laughs> all of that stuff comes from like, they, they, we only shot our interviews, and uh, a lot of it is sort of Greenpeace footage. All of the reenactment kind of stuff is from, I think, I mean, Sophie, Sophie, our producer, who's, 
who's also here, <laughs> um, would, would be able to tell you what I think we, we pulled it from. Zephy, come here. Sort of seven, yeah, seven, 70 different movies. Um, 70. It, I, it's, 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 it's really just, you know, um, and that's pulled from uh, French, the French army was actually super helpful in pulling like training footage. So they gave us all their, their training. And it's sort of a side note, I ended up drafted in the French army, so I served uh, as a French citizen. So I served in the French army and I was drafted as a documentary director for the French army and served in the French army archives. So I went there 20 years later and it's all exactly the same people and my desk is in the same place. And I'm like, hey, I used to work here uh, and I'm doing this thing. They're like, my girl, America, hey, what do you need? And they opened the archives. They declassified footage for us. Um, and then there, but all the stuff of, of like the, the, you know, when, when he's talking about, you know, the major came to me and I mean, all, all the French army footage, the scuba diving stuff, the stuff with um, uh, a lot of that is from the army, and then the other crazy thing is, so the guy, the guy who opens the film, um, who trips and miss, misses his mark, um, he he he, he uh, uh, he's part of one documentary that did reenactments in the eighties. Um, was that one was from eighty five? Then there was another documentary called the Rainbow Warrior Affair, which was eighty six, and then we found other footage, and they all use the actual vehicle vehicles to do their reenactments in the 80s and i thought i'd just use the 80s reenactment videos which is so much better and in that sort of 16 millimeter quality so um and that's really intercut and you sort of see it you, you you're looking this way and it's one film from 86 and then it cuts back and you're in the film from 85 and then 86 and so, so that's where it's a, it's really a mix of i we we went looking for all kinds of footage that would illustrate it and keep it Sort of what, fun. What's Operation Satanic? That movie. Th that's th we made, we sort of made that up. Oh, okay. I mean, you make it the that's graphics what, that's what the, the operation. But they called the operation Operation Satanic. Operation Satanic was their internal code name for this. Yeah. Right? Go figure. <laughs> I mean, could you, it, of of yeah. Um, they felt really felt threatened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean. And they this was hugely this was hugely embarrassing at the time for France, not just that they did it. That's embarrassing, and then the fact that they lied and they lied and they lied and they lied and every time they lied, like they lied about you know how they beat up David McTaggart in the very beginning, the first the, f the very first year, they lied, they lied, they lied, and then Anne Marie, as we hear in this film, smuggled the film out. And um, when, those, when those pictures hit the newspapers in the 70s, it was a bombshell uh, because they had to walk back all those lies. And anyway, it, I want to just say I thought it was a great job of researching that archival material and using that to tell this story. It was beautiful. I was really, I was really impressed with that. It wasn't just me, I had a huge, huge team, and obviously I mean, my editor's incredible, Chris Dallas Feeney, he was, he was not here, but he was great. Um, my, my composer, never composed before, um, William Service, he's incredible. Um, um, and George is here too, she's, she was, she was the co-producer. Marwan, she's right there, he's, he, he helped me a lot on the creative and the sort of aesthetic of it all. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it's big, big effort, lots of people, so, and obviously, you know, Lawrence, Sophie, my other producers. What was the biggest hurdle, Lawrence, to make this film? <coughs> the biggest hurdle? There were many. Um, financially, it was difficult to make, but we got there. Um, the archive was incredibly difficult to source and to convince people to let us use it. Um, um, there were lots of delays. You know, the, the thing is this, is that what we believed in when we got involved in the film is the vision that Edward had. And when, you know, there were, we, we were delayed. There was a lot of delays in, in getting to that vision for a number of different reasons, whether we had enough footage, whether we had uh, the right music, whatever it was. But what, 
COVID was difficult getting to New Zealand. There was a lot of hurdles that we had to overcome, but the reality was is that what we all decided to do was to make sure that the film was the vision that we originally agreed that we were going to do. And so, you know, we, we, we took a lot of hits because of it, but it really was that, is that we didn't want to waver from the vision, and that was really the original teaser that we saw, and the tone of it, and the style of it, and the, the way that the story was going to unfold like a almost like a, a spoof, like a, like Inspector Clouseau, you know, kind of like a, the, uh, uh, so, so that there was a wit to it and there was something that a younger audience might engage with rather than being told this happened at this point and then this happened and that happened, but there was something that they could hold on to and, and as Rex said, and as Edward said, something that maybe would inspire someone to think, I can do something. And so the hurdle was making sure that we didn't waver from the vision that Edward originally created in, a, in an extraordinary way. And I applaud him for that, for not giving up. OK, we have time for one last question. You go. Uh, so it's, just, it's been a real honor to watch this. Um, a couple of us worked at Greenpeace more recently. And it's funny, actually, how in the organization, the story is still not that well known. And it's certainly not um, well understood. So it was really amazing to watch all of this footage. Um, I think. I would, I would kind of highlight one of the differences that we experience now versus in the 70s, which is just like extreme content overload and the, the role of the mind bomb being something that has, like, uh, people are so used to seeing catastrophe all the time now. Um, and I think what you're showing in this, in this the story is very, it's more about inspiration and hope than it is about kind of blowing people's minds with kind of the shock that, that Greenpeace kind of deploys. I'm just wondering how how you try and maximize the amount of people that see this because in the content sort of saturated world that we live in is there a plan for kind of the distribution I think the first thing you guys can do is every single one as you as you as you go out there there's a there's a there's a, a, a QR code um, for the audience award so so everyone who holds a ticket should go and help us on on that um, in terms of the distribution plan and the rest <laughs> In, in, in terms of the captive audience of Greenpeace, which has 100 million um, people on their mailing list, so to speak, um, we're, we're in the process of organizing, well, we were going to do it before this, but then this happened, that we were accepted to this festival. So around the world, in conjunction with Greenpeace, we're doing screenings in well, the beginning 10 territories and then more, um, which we'll, we'll be able to utilize their uh, um, database to bring people in. Um, as well as that, you know, we're, we're partnered up with Fremantle, which is, is a, an extraordinarily efficient and large distribution um, and sales company to help us get the film sold in as many territories as possible. Um, and there's more festivals coming up. Um, there'll be more screenings. And, and so, so the idea is to work in conjunction with Greenpeace today. Um, and we've been doing that for the last year, I would think. Um, just getting that organized. Pardon me? Yeah. And yeah. Them in Paris, yeah. yeah, and and yeah. and so so th that's our that's our initial plan. But we're not going to let the film just pop up and disappear. Thank you. Thank you so much for making this brilliant film, and thank you so much for coming to watch it.